26th of September, 2024, the final KC-10 extender in the U.S. Air Force inventory departed Travis Air Force Base on its way to the Boneyard at Davis Mothin Air Force Base in Arizona. Marking the end of nearly 45 years of service, this event raises crucial questions. What factors led to the retirement of one of the most capable air refueling aircraft in history? What aircraft will replace it? How does this transition impact the Air Force's global operational capabilities? Before we answer these questions, let's jump into the Wayback Machine and look at the origins and impact of in-flight refueling and the mighty KC-10. From the beginning of aviation, especially military aviation, aircraft design has been a balancing act between payload and range. Aircraft that can fly long distances but not carry anything are as impractical as planes that can carry large payloads but have to land often to refuel. Early on, designers began looking at ways to refuel aircraft in flight. In 1921, a U.S. Army Air Service wing walker with a gas can strapped to his back climbed from one airborne aircraft to another and poured gas into the tank. The first example of a practical gravity-fed in-flight refueling occurred on June 27, 1923 in San Diego, California, when two Army Air Service lieutenants passed gas between two DH-4B biplanes. However, by year's end, after multiple attempts and incremental improvements, the Air Service stopped testing altogether, primarily because of budgetary constraints. A pivotal milestone occurred from January 1st to January 7th, 1929, when the question mark mission proved the operational viability of aero refueling by remaining airborne for 151 hours. The mission was led by future U.S. Air Force leaders like Carl Spatz, later commander of the United States Strategic Air Forces in Europe in 1944, and the first chief of staff of the newly created independent U.S. Air Force. Ira Aker, Deputy Commander of the Army Air Forces during World War II, and Elwood Caseda, Commander of the 9th Tactical Air Command in Europe during World War II, and the first Administrator of the FAA. During the interwar years, the British Royal Air Force continued refueling experimentation while the U.S. largely abandoned the concept. However, World War II reignited interest and in 1943, successful tests demonstrated the increased operational range available from in-flight refueling. One proposal looked at launching B-17s from Midway against Japan using modified B-24s as tankers. Another concept called for B-17s to tow fuel-laden gliders to serve as tankers. The strain these modifications would make on wartime aircraft production and the increased range of the newly developed B-29 put aerial refueling on hold for the duration of World War II. After the war, by 1948, Strategic Air Command recognized in-flight refueling as a strategic necessity and set the transition for modern aero refueling. In the 1950s, Strategic Air Command introduced the propeller-driven KC-97 and later the KC-135, a jet-powered tanker that revolutionized air mobility. However, as aircraft grew in size and range requirements expanded, the KC-135's limitations became evident. This led to a request for the Advanced Tanker Cargo Aircraft. The request for proposal was issued. Two companies responded to the program. Boeing based its proposal on the 747, while McDonnell Douglas based theirs on the DC-10. In 1977, the U.S. Air Force selected the KC-10A, while the 747 offered larger capacity, the KC-10 was cheaper and offered the ability to take off with a maximum fuel load from a shorter runway. Between 1981 and 1990, the Air Force received 60 KC-10s. The KC-10 became the cornerstone of both Strategic Air Command and later Air Mobility Command operations. The KC-10 over the years played a critical role in numerous military operations. During Operation Urgent Fury, the U.S. invasion of Grenada in 1983, the KC-10 provided refueling support to fighter, bomber, and transport aircraft. In 1986, Operation El Dorado Canyon, still the longest distance fighter mission of all time, the KC-10 made the long-range retaliatory airstrikes on Libya possible. With Spain and Germany denying the U.S. overflights, the mission ended up covering 6,000 miles round trip. During Operation Desert Storm in 1991, the KC-10 delivered over 50 million pounds of fuel to coalition aircraft. 
The KC-10 was also instrumental in operations in Haiti, Somalia, Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. By the early 2000s, both the KC-135 and KC-10 were aging, requiring a replacement. The KCX program resulted in the 2011 selection of Boeing's KC-46 Pegasus as the Air Force's next generation tanker. After the initial selection of the Airbus Northrop Grumman A330 multi-role tanker transport, marketed as the KC-30, was overturned following a Boeing protest. The decision was driven by the need for modernized capabilities, along with the high operational costs associated with the KC-10, largely due to its reliance on contractor-operated and maintained base supply, or COMS, as a logistics model. While designed to enhance refueling capabilities, the KC-46 program faced significant developmental and operational challenges. With the stated goal of improving crew communication, safety, and comfort, Boeing elected to move the boom operator from the traditional position in the rear of the aircraft, where the operator used their Mark I Mod Zero eyeballs to view receivers, to the front of the aircraft utilizing a remote vision system consisting of cameras and VR goggles. The remote vision system suffered from visual distortions and high glare conditions, hampering the precision required for refueling. Issues with the refueling boom included stiffness, making it incompatible with lighter weight aircraft, software issues with the boom's advanced systems, and vibrations that have caused damage to receiver aircraft. Recently, cracks were discovered in the outboard fixed trailing edge support structures, prompting fleet-wide inspections. Early inspections of the Boeing factory revealed numerous quality control deficiencies, including foreign object debris in the fuel tanks and other critical areas. These inspections led to numerous delays in aircraft deliveries. To date, Boeing has absorbed over $7 billion in unexpected costs due to contract miscalculations and delays. Due to the firm fixed price nature of the contract, Boeing is unable to pass these cost overruns on to the government. Despite these setbacks, the KC-46 remains central to the future of Air Force tanker operations with additional interim solutions proposed, such as the KCY bridge tanker and then the next generation air refueling system or in-gas program, designed to act as bridge tankers to cover the eventual retirement of the KC-135. The next frontier in air refueling is the integration of unmanned systems. The Boeing MQ-25 Stingray, a carrier-based drone, represents a significant leap in automated refueling capabilities. These innovations enhance operational flexibility, reduce human risk in contested environments, and extends the reach of naval aviation assets. So what killed the KC-10? The KC-10 outperformed the 135 and 46 in all relevant metrics. It can carry 356,000 pounds of fuel compared to a maximum of 203,000 for the KC-135 and 212 for the KC-46. The KC-10 can carry more cargo, both in weight and pallets, 170,000 pounds compared to the 83,000 pounds for the KC-135 and 65 for the KC-46. This comes from 27 pallet positions for the KC-10 compared to 6 for the KC-135 and 18 for the KC-46. The KC-10 has a useful load, the total weight of cargo and fuel it can carry of 322,000 pounds far exceeding the 224,000 of the KC-135 and the 233,000 pounds of the KC-46. If the KC-10 significantly outperforms all other tankers, why did the Air Force decide to retire this workhorse? It comes down to cost and fleet size. The KC-10 contractor operated and maintained base supply, or COMS contract, costs the Air Force $1.5 billion every nine years, just over $2.8 billion per aircraft annually. Add this to the other sustainment costs for the aircraft and the KC-10 was just too expensive. In my opinion, fleet size was the ultimate deciding factor. While 830 KC-135s were built over the life of the program, 398 are still operational. Although the request for a proposal that got us the KC-46 was for a tanker to replace the 135, Congress only authorized a final purchase of 179, not nearly enough to replace the 135. The cost of the KC-46, estimated at $44.4 billion or $248 million per aircraft, including developmental costs, procurement costs, and military construction costs to support the aircraft at the designated bases, 
cases informed the decision to buy only 179. With only 59 KC-10s operational, retiring the extender was the easy button decision. Although retired from Air Force service, there's hope for continued life for the KC-10. There are plans for Omega Air, a civilian in-flight refueling company, to purchase KC-10s and operate them for the U.S. and its allies. Omega currently operates two converted Boeing KC-707s, along with three converted McDonnell Douglas KDC-10s purchased from the Royal Netherlands Air Force. The KC-10 extender was more than just an aero refueling platform. It was a strategic enabler that shaped modern air power doctrine. Its retirement marks the end of an era, but its contributions will remain a major part of air mobility history. As the Air Force transitions to the KC-46 and explores unmanned refueling solutions, the KC-10's legacy endures in both its operational lessons and its continued commercial application.